Okay, well, we're going to um, look at um, an interesting passage this evening, uh, verses 15 through uh, 28 of Matthew 24. Remember, this is the Olivet Discourse. I am going to review what we have seen up to this point, um, hopefully uh, briefly. But I do want to give to you, as we review, the main reasons why R.C. Sproul, when we looked at this um, last year, I think it was, I keep forgetting what it was, last year or the year before, it was last year, why he believed that this was referring to 70 A.D., and I think it, it's really quite clear. Okay, but let me read the passage first, okay, beginning in verse 15. Jesus says, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place. Let the reader understand. Then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. Whoever is on the housetop must not go down to get the things out that are in his house. Whoever is in the field must not turn back to get his cloak. But woe to, the, to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. But pray that your flight will not be in the winter or on a Sabbath, for then there will be a great tribulation such as has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will. Unless those days had been cut short, no life would have been saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. Then if anyone says to you, behold, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe him. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and will show great signs and wonders so as to mislead, if possible, even the elect. Behold, I have told you in advance. So if they say to you, behold, he is in the wilderness, do not go out. Or behold, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe them. For just as the lightning comes from the east and flashes even to the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. Wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. <laughs> See, easy to understand, right? Very straightforward. <laughs> okay, well, hopefully it'll become a little bit clearer. And again, nobody, nobody knows, you know, everything in Scripture, especially when it comes to prophecy, with exact accuracy. But I do think we have strong grounds to believe that this position is, is really a very strong position. So again, remember, we're looking at prophecy as the evidence that the Bible is God's Word. I've mentioned to you before, only God could possibly know what's going to happen in the future. And that's because, again, of the unlimited knowledge that He has. He knows everything that's going to come to pass, everything that could come to pass. And because He has planned the end from the beginning. Remember the Bible, He tells us in the Bible that uh, He works all things according to the counsel of His will. Okay. God has a plan. God knows the future. He's seen the future. And of course, as Jonathan Edwards said before, and I hope this, I hope this makes sense, God couldn't know the future unless He knew what was going to happen, which means that what He sees is going to take place, and that's what He's telling us is actually going to happen. He tells us before it takes place so that when it happens, we will know that He is the Lord. Now, remember, the Bible is really the only book that claims to be inspired by God that contains predictions made hundreds, some thousands of years before they took place and the events take place just as God said that they would, and that means the Bible must be His Word. Now, this is an objective argument that one can, can look at without having to have the Holy Spirit to... to um, give you that conviction to confirm that the Bible is, is His Word, but I have to say that unless somebody has the Spirit of God, they will likely try to deny it, even if they see it. Still, we are called upon to give reasons. Now, tonight we're continuing to look at the Olivet Discourse, the prediction Jesus made of the temple's destruction, not a temple that's going to be built sometime in the future that the Jews are still hoping to build, but the temple that existed in those days, that's the one he was referring to. This was God's judgment against the Jews for rejecting Jesus Christ. Now, we're looking at this, the Olivet Discourse, the things that Jesus is saying in here from what's called the moderate preterist position 
fancy term for saying we're looking at it as, as something that took place in the past and it's called moderate because there are, there's a, another camp called radical preterism that believes that all prophecy has been fulfilled and we are living in the eternal state. We do not believe that. Okay, so, but what it does teach is that what Jesus said here in 30 A.D. was fulfilled in 70 A.D. during the war of the Jews with Rome. Now, let's not forget the strength of this position. You know, it's, it's interesting. Um, Ken Gentry, and, and he, his, his strength is, is eschatology. Uh, he's written extensively on this subject, and when I did a series on this years ago, I used his book, He Shall Have Dominion, and I would recommend that book. That's a very good book for this. But he is also writing a three-volume commentary on the book of Revelation, which is in the process of being published, and it's going to be his greatest work from this perspective. And the thing he points out in the book of Revelation to try to show us what the book is about are the time frame references. When does John say, or when does Jesus, who's telling John this prophecy, when does he say this is going to take place? Well, we need to do the same thing when it comes to this because he gives us time frames. He gives us a target group that this is really focused against, and we need to pay attention to those things. Well, Jesus said, first of all, in Matthew 23, okay, the chapter before Matthew 24, which has the Olivet Discourse, 24 and 25, that he was going to charge the generation that was alive at that time with the guilt of all the righteous blood shed on earth. And remember, the reason for that is because they were going to kill Jesus. And they were going to kill his apostles and his prophets, okay? So Jesus said, on account of this, I'm going to charge this generation with the guilt of all the righteous blood shed on earth. Well. You know, chapter 23 and 24 are not separated by a great length of time. 23 takes place in the temple. In the opening verses of 24, they walk out of the temple. So it's following right on the heels of that pronouncement of judgment, okay? And that's when the disciples, you know, they, they had just heard Jesus saying to the Jews, your house or your temple is going to be left to you desolate. Well, then the He's, he's turned the disciples' attention to the, the temple buildings, right? So they're looking at all these wonderful buildings, these huge stones, and they're thinking, how could this happen? Well, Matthew 24, Jesus is answering the disciples' questions when the temple buildings would be torn down. Because Jesus said, not one stone will be left upon another which will not be torn down. So when is that going to happen, Jesus? And what is going to be the sign of your coming? Now, they weren't talking about the second coming, but his coming in judgment to charge them with this guilt, to bring this judgment, and to tear down the temple, and of the end of the age. You know, it's not that the disciples suddenly started thinking about the second coming when Jesus said that, but they were asking questions about the destruction of the temple, and all of these questions really had to do with that. When's the temple going to be torn down? When are you coming in judgment? What's going to be the sign of the end of the age? And that would be the Jewish age, which ends with the tearing down of the temple. Well, also in Matthew 24, remember, as he's describing what's going to take place, he is continually warning the disciples of, of what they had to look for, what they, had to, uh, what they were going to have to endure, okay? And what they were supposed to do when this time actually came. And why was he warning them? Well, it's because they were going to live to see it. This generation will not pass away until all these things come to pass. And actually, I just jumped ahead to the, the main reason that we should believe that Jesus was talking about that time frame, okay? Because he gives us a clear reference to the time frame in verse 34 of Matthew 24 of when all of this was going to take place, not 2,000 years in the future. You know, we're 2,000 years um, Aren't we? Not, not quite, almost 2,000 years from when Jesus said this. But this is what he says in verse 34, truly I say to you, pay attention to this, right? He says, pay attention to this. This generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Now, why is it that that generation wasn't going to pass away until all these things happen? It's because... <clears throat> 
that was the generation he was holding responsible for his death because they were the ones that were going to kill him. And the generation that would mistreat and kill his apostles and his prophets. That would be the generation that would experience this judgment. Okay, so those time frame references, the target audience, the whole purpose of this, the questions that Jesus was answering, they all point to 70 A.D. Now, last week, and I'm just going to mention briefly, we saw the signs that this judgment was coming. Okay, um, and we, had, we saw examples, I'm not going to repeat any of them, from the ancient historians who gave us snippets of things like this taking place within that time frame. False Christs and prophets, wars, famines, earthquakes, pestilences, persecutions, increased wickedness, loss of natural affection. Okay? Jesus said those would be the signs that this is approaching, and we saw that they in fact did take place. Jesus also said the gospel would be preached throughout the entire world. Okay? Now, remember that we have to make sure we understand what Jesus said, the way his audience understood it, and not the way we would understand it today. Today, we, we are much more aware of the world than the disciples were. But in their day, the whole world had a specific meaning, and that was the Roman Empire. Before this judgment would come, the Lord had ordered that, that his Apostles take the gospel out to the entire world, to the entire Roman Empire. Go to the Jew first because God had fulfilled his promise of sending the Messiah that he had promised for so many years. And they all needed to hear that he had come and they needed to have a chance to receive him. And then when they didn't listen, of course, to turn to the Gentiles. And you know that Luke records that that actually took place. The entire Roman Empire was evangelized. Paul writes in his letters, the whole world had heard about the gospel. Okay, now, Paul was martyred in 64, somewhere around 64, 65 AD, and in his lifetime, while he was writing letters, he said the task had already been accomplished. So, Again, what Jesus said would take place prior to 70 AD actually did take place. Now, this evening, let's consider the sign that the judgment had come. And that sign was the abomination of desolation. Okay. Now, again, we're going to understand this a little bit differently than the way that it's understood today, which is sometime in the future, you know, after the rapture of the church, the Antichrist is going to rise up and he's going to caused, allowed the Jews to rebuild their temple, and in the middle of the seven-year period, he's going to uh, set up uh, an image of himself in the temple, and that's the abomination of desolation. Well, that's not what the Jews understood. That's not what his disciples understood, okay, what this meant, and we're going to look at that. So, this is what Jesus says in verses 15 through 17. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down to get the things out that are in his house, and let him who is in the field not turn back to get his cloak. Now, I want you to notice, first of all, that Jesus says to his disciples, when you see this, okay, then you get out of town. Notice he was saying they would see it. Notice, secondly, what it is they would see, the abomination of desolation. And you know what? Jesus didn't even have to explain it to them because they knew what he was referring to. He was referring to what we looked at a few weeks ago in the book of Daniel. And I want to take just a moment here to read that passage again because it has relevance to what we're looking at here. So, remember Daniel's praying, he knows the 70 years of exile are just about up, and he's wondering what's next on God's prophetic timetable. And so, as he's praying, he's fasting, and eventually Gabriel comes to him. And he says to him in chapter 9 of Daniel, verses 24 through 27, 70 weeks have been decreed for your people and your holy city to finish the transgression to make an end of sin, to make atonement for iniquity, 
to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. So you are to know and discern that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. It will be built again with plaza and moat, even in times of distress. Then after the 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. And the people of the Prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. And its end will come with a flood. Even to the end there will be war. Desolations are determined. And he, the, the prince, will make a firm covenant with the many for one week. But in the middle of the week he will put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering. And on the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate, even until a complete destruction. One that is decreed is poured out on the one who makes desolate. Now, let's just review briefly what we saw before when we, when we looked at this passage. Okay, first of all, this prophecy tells us when Jesus would begin His ministry. From the time of this decree that was issued to restore and rebuild Jerusalem to the beginning of His ministry would be 69 weeks, 7 weeks and 62 weeks, which we believe are weeks of years, 483 years. Artaxerxes, Artaxerxes, king of Persia, issued a decree in 457 B.C. that allowed the Jews to go back and begin to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. And 483 years later, Jesus began his ministry in 26, around 26, 27 A.D. So it tells us when he would come. It tells us, secondly, how his ministry would end. After the 69 weeks which would put us in the 70th week, he would be cut off, which means he would be put to death. Now, this passage tells us what that death would accomplish. In the middle of the week, he will put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering. Now, notice in the middle of the week, he'll make a firm covenant with the many for a week. In the middle of the week, he's going to, be, he's going to put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering. Well, what is that talking about? Jesus' ministry lasted for three and a half years, which is in the middle of a week of seven years. In the middle of the week, he was crucified. When he was crucified, the veil of the temple was torn. It put an end to the Old Testament sacrificial system. He ended it by fulfilling it. And that's what all these other terms are referring to when it says he would seal up vision and prophecy and bring in everlasting righteousness. It was through his work, a work of redemption. But it also, this passage also tells us what would happen after this. It doesn't say it's going to happen during the 70th week. It just simply says it will happen. It says this, and the people of the prince who is to come, and that prince who is to come is not the Antichrist. In this context, the prince who is coming is Messiah the prince. The people of the Messiah, those whom he was going to use to bring his judgment. In this case, the Roman armies will destroy the city and the sanctuary. That is the abomination of desolation, the desolation of Jerusalem, the desolation of the house of God, which Jesus in Matthew 23 says, your house is being left to you desolate. One commentator says, note that Jesus calls the temple their house and not God's house, because the Lord has withdrawn from them. When Jesus left the temple, that was the end of it for that system and for God's dealing with the Jews in, in that particular case, apart from, of course, the continuing work of His gathering His people from among them, which continues to this day. So this prophecy concludes in this way. On the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate, even until a complete destruction, one that is decreed is poured out on the one who makes desolate. Because the Jews rejected and murdered Christ, the coming prince, okay, Christ would send the Romans, the people of the prince, to destroy their city and their sanctuary and make it desolate. 
Now, it's interesting that in a parallel passage to uh, Matthew 24, and where Luke is recording the same event, in Luke 21, verses 20 through 22, listen to how Jesus speaks of the abomination of desolation, okay? And, and just get the language here. But when you see, now he doesn't say the abomination of desolation, but he says this, but when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then recognize her desolation is at hand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those who are in the midst of the city depart. And let not those who are in the country enter the city, because these are days of vengeance in order that all things which are written may be fulfilled. What, what I want you to notice is that in Luke's account, Jesus is referring to the abomination of desolation as Jerusalem being surrounded by armies. Uh, when you see that, know that her desolation is at hand. So the abomination of desolation begins with the armies of Rome marching on Jerusalem, which took place during the war of the Jews with Rome, but doesn't end until Titus dismantles the temple. What happened was they set it on fire. You probably heard this before. And the gold that was in the temple melted and ran down into the cracks of the stones. And not wanting to waste any good gold, the Romans took the temple apart in order to get it back. Okay. So it doesn't end until Titus dismantles the temple. Remember what Jesus said? Not one stone will be left upon another which will not be torn down. Titus tore the temple down stone by stone. And then he set his ensigns or his standards against the eastern gate and offered sacrifices to them. Now we're going to come back to that because there may be some reference to this in this text as well. Now, Jesus says in this passage that when they saw this beginning to happen, when they, when they saw the Jerusalem surrounded by armies, they were immediately to run. He says those who are on the housetop were not supposed to come down okay, into their houses to get anything out because they wouldn't have time. Now, remember the Jews, um, they, unlike us, they actually spent time on their roofs. You know, that was like an extra room for them. Um, they were for recreation or for prayer and meditation. I think I've even heard that they entertained on the roof. Must have been, of course, supported. And why they needed to put a fence around their roof so that nobody would fall off and, and get injured. But usually the Jew had two ways to access their roof. They had two ladders, one on the outside and one on the inside. And what Jesus is telling them here is when you see the armies coming, if you're on top of the roof... Don't take the inside ladder to go into the house to get anything out. Take the outside ladder and get out, okay? Just get out of the country. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to escape. This happened very suddenly, and the people who were not ready were trapped. Now, again, when you consider what happened to the Jews who were trapped inside the city, which we will look at in just a few moments you know it would be far better to get stranded outside the city, outside the country with nothing, okay, than to get trapped in the city with all your possessions because, again, of the horrors of what was going to take place, not to mention the fact you wouldn't be able to hang on to any of your possessions anyway. Okay, because of what was going to happen. All right. Now, likewise, he says the one who was in the field was not to turn back to get his cloak. Now, then, like today, if you're working outside on a hot day and you're wearing a, a, a coat, you, you take it off and you, you put it somewhere where it's, where it's safe. And what Jesus is saying here was if you're out in the field working and you see the armies coming, don't worry about your coat. Just get out of there. Otherwise, again, you are not going to have time to escape. You could not afford even a moment's delay they had to head straight for the mountains. Now, history tells us that the unbelieving Jews didn't listen to Jesus, were caught off guard, and they were trapped inside the city. But Eusebius, who is a fourth century historian, tells us the Christians were ready, and they fled to a city named Pella. 
which is a little more than halfway between the Dead Sea and the Sea of Galilee on the eastern side of the Jordan River, and they survived. So the sign that God's judgment had come, the abomination of desolation, was the Roman armies marching on Jerusalem. When they saw this, they were to get out of the country. But Jesus says that trip was going to be very difficult. So he continues, verse 19, but woe to those who are with child and to those who nurse babes in those days. Woe means here how horrible it will be. Now, as you know, in the Jewish culture, expecting a baby, having a baby, that, that's a wonderful blessing. It is in our culture as well, right? But not at this time, okay, because of the journey. Being, you know, an expectant mother, having a baby would make this journey very difficult. There wouldn't be the, the resources. There wouldn't be time to stop for rest. There wouldn't be time to stop and take care of the child's needs. But still, whatever difficulties they had to face would still be better than staying and facing God's judgment. Jesus also says, but pray that your flight may not be in the winter in verse 20. In the winter, the days are shorter, temperatures are colder, the weather is less certain, less agreeable, there's rain, there's flooding, even snow in some areas. The disciples were to pray, notice they were to pray, you pray, okay, that it doesn't happen on one, on, on, well, at least in the winter because of the difficulties, or he says on the Sabbath. By the way, it's interesting, isn't it, because this was going to happen in 70 A.D., and Jesus says to his disciples, pray that your having to get out of Jerusalem doesn't happen on the Sabbath day, which was still going to be enforced, you know, it's still going to be practiced and, uh, and, and kept at that time, okay, showing us the Sabbath did exist after uh, Jesus uh, finished his work. Because if the armies came on God's holy day of rest and worship, they would be more likely to be caught off guard and less prepared. I mean, if the armies happen to surround you while you're in synagogue, what are you going to do? You can't see. You can't see what's going on. So pray that it's not on the Sabbath. Or the Christians gather together on the Christian Sabbath on the first day of the week. Same thing would happen. Now, Jesus goes on to say, verse 21, For then there will be a great tribulation, such as has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever shall. It's God's judgment on the Jews for rejecting His Son. The desolation of their house, He says, would be worse than anything any people ever had or ever would endure. Okay, he's saying it's going to be, it was, it was worse, okay, and from his perspective, it's going to be, from our perspective in the past, worse than the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, worse than the plagues upon the Egyptians, worse than the captivity of the Jews into Assyria. And we would have to say if it's, if it's worse than anything that would happen, it was worse than what the Jews had to endure during the Holocaust. None of these things would compare. And, you know, you really can't understand that unless you know a little bit about what happened to the Jews during this time frame. Josephus tells us in his War of the Jews, and by the way, Josephus was a Jew. He was captured by the Romans. The Jews thought he was a traitor. He was trying to persuade while in captivity. They honored him because he was a general, and he was apparently a very well-known and well-honored general by the Jews until his capture. But the Romans honored him. They were hoping to get some information out of him as you do with captives and so forth. But the information he gave them, he was trying to keep them from destroying Jerusalem and the temple. He was not successful. But in the process, he also writes an account of what took place. So he tells us in the War of the Jews that the Romans laid siege to the city at one of the Jewish feasts, and it happened to be Passover, when many more were present in Jerusalem than at other times of the year, remember there are three feasts that every Jewish man, who had everyone from their bar mitzvah on, had to um, attend. So there were thousands of people. You know how that worked at Pentecost? All the crowds were there when Peter preaches. Well, it worked against them 
at the Passover in 70 AD. So they laid siege to the city, which means that there were many people trapped inside of Jerusalem. And this happened at the end of the war, which lasted for three and a half years, when they suddenly came in with this army and surrounded the city, and the siege lasted for five months. Now, not only was the war going on outside the city, but inside the city, there was a civil war that was taking place. As I understand it, the city was divided into three factions, and each one trying to get the resources for themselves, which were very limited. And that made, of course, the person who wasn't very important, uh, it, it impoverished them. They had nothing, right? So many died at the hands of their own countrymen from plague, sickness that broke out, uh, from famine. People were killing their neighbors for a morsel of food, and some were so hungry that they were even eating their own children. I'm not sure that we read of anything like that happening in the Holocaust. Many others were killed by the Romans when they finally broke into the city. Josephus records that in the war altogether and in the siege of Jerusalem, there were 1,100,000 Jews that died. He writes in the introduction to the Jewish war or the subtitle, The History of the Destruction of Jerusalem, Quote, the war which the Jews made with the Romans has been the greatest of all those, not only that have been in our times, but in a manner, uh, in a manner, of those that ever were heard of. Both of those were in cities of fought against cities or nations against nations, close quote. Remember what Jesus said to the Jews, he who falls on this stone, stone the builders rejected, he who falls on the stone will be broken to pieces. I think he's referring there to those who bow before Christ. But on whomever it falls, it will scatter him like dust. Well, he's the stone that fell in judgment in 70 AD on the Jews for rejecting him, and he scattered them like dust. But now he goes on to say that he would have mercy on those who were his. Verse 22. Unless those days had been cut short, no life would have been saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. Now he says, if the war had continued any longer than it did, all the Jews would have been wiped out, not only in the city, but also in the country where the same war was being fought. But the Lord cut the time short to spare his elect, okay, those who belong to him, those converted before the war. Those may be converted during the war. Those trapped in the city when the Romans surrounded it. There were some that were believers that were trapped. And those who were yet to be born from the survivors of those, you know, who would believe in him. So he, he, it would have been worse, but God cut it short for the sake of his people. Then Jesus goes on to repeat his warning about false Christs, and he tells them how his coming will be distinguished from theirs. And it almost seems like he's talking about that time frame and maybe what's coming up just before that because when he talks about his coming, he's not referring to his second coming still. He's still referring to his coming in judgment against Jerusalem. And um, as I read this passage, or reread it, bear in mind that we should not see Christ here in the way the Jews would see Christ. Okay, remember our conception of Christ is, of course, the right one. He, he came to redeem His people. We see Him as a Savior and Lord. But they saw Christ as a political leader, a military leader who would lead them against Rome and deliver them from Rome. So think about that. He says in verses 23 through 27, then if anyone says to you, Behold, here is the Christ, or there he is. Do not believe him, for false Christs and false prophets will arise and will show great signs and wonders so as to mislead, if possible, even the elect. Behold, I have told you in advance. So if they say to you, behold, he is in the wilderness, this is why I think this is referring to, he's, he's looking back at that time frame maybe before his coming, especially because he talks about what his coming will be like. Because if he's in the wilderness, there's nothing they can do to get out there. They're trapped in the city. So 
If they say to you, Behold, he's in the wilderness, do not go out, or behold, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe them. For just as the lightning comes from the east and flashes even to the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. Okay, so remember, I've already told you the Jewish conception of the Christ, and apparently their hope of deliverance, of deliverance by the Messiah was, was certainly elevated during this war, and they were hoping that, you know, grabbing on to any straws of hope that one claiming to be the Christ would be him and would deliver them. And Jesus said there would be those making this claim during this time frame. Now, we did see earlier that there was a false prophet who led many thousands of the Jews into the wilderness to fight against the Romans. And this, I believe, was before the war took place. Josephus writes this in the War of the Jews. But there was an Egyptian false prophet that did the Jews more mischief than the former, for he was a cheat and pretended to be a prophet also, and got together 30,000 men that were deluded by him. These he led round about from the wilderness to the mount, which was called the Mount of Olives, and was ready to break into Jerusalem by force from that place. And if he could but once conquer the Roman garrison and the people, he intended to domineer over them by the assistance of those guards of his that were to break into the city with him. But Felix prevented his attempt and met him with his Roman soldiers, while all the people assisted him in his attack upon them, inasmuch that when it came to a battle, the Egyptian ran away with a few others, while the greatest part of those that were with him were either destroyed or taken alive, but the rest of the multitude were dispersed, every one to their own homes, and there concealed themselves. Now, again, Jesus said false prophets that arise prior to his coming. And again, Jesus might have been referring to that here. But there was another event that at least is recorded that took place just after the Romans broke into Jerusalem following the siege. Again, Josephus writes this, the soldiers also came to the rest of the cloisters that were in the outer court of the temple, whither the women and the children and a great mixed multitude of the people fled in number, about 6,000. But before Caesar had determined anything about these people or given the commanders any orders relating to them, the soldiers were in such a rage that they set that cloister on fire, by which means it came to pass that some of these were destroyed by throwing themselves down headlong and some were burnt in the cloisters themselves. Nor did any of them escape with his life. A false prophet was the occasion of these people's destruction, who had made a public proclamation in the city that very day that God commanded them to get up upon the temple and that there they should receive miraculous signs of their deliverance. Now, there was then a great number of false prophets suborned by the tyrants to impose on the people who denounced this to them, that they should wait for deliverance from God, and this was in order to keep them from deserting, and that they might be buoy, buoyed up above fear and care by such hopes. Now, a man that is in adversity does easily comply with such promises, for when such a seducer makes him believe that he shall be delivered from those miseries which oppress him, then it is that the patient is full of hopes of such his deliverance, close quote. So again, Jesus said there would be false Christ, false prophets who would deceive many and bring about their destruction. Now, in contrast to that, these false Christs, Jesus said the true Christ, his coming in judgment would not be in secret, not in the wilderness, not in the secret chambers, but public, powerful, and swift as lightning. Verse 27, for just as the lightning comes from the east and flashes even to the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. Now remember, Jesus doesn't come down personally. Let's see, I'm wondering, uh, yeah, I think we are going to look at this maybe, maybe next week. But um, God often brings judgment, in the Old Testament he did, um, against a nation and he represents himself as coming, even on the clouds, okay? Uh, riding the clouds like a chariot, coming in judgment, but doesn't come down bodily to the world, but rather comes in the person of a foreign army to bring judgment on that nation. And that's what Jesus is referring to here. Now, 
I was going to look it up. I tried to find it, but I wasn't able to. But I do believe that there is an historic reference to where these armies actually came from when they came. We think of, you know, Rome is in, is in the West. And we think, of, you know, the Roman armies must be coming from the West and moving toward the East to come to Jerusalem. But we mustn't forget that the entire world was in the power of the Roman Empire and they had garrisons and they had troops everywhere. And I believe they had several that were east of Jerusalem, and those were the ones that marched. And so he says, as, the, you know, as lightning comes from the east and flashes even to the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be, not to deliver, but to bring judgment. And now, finally, he uses a familiar proverb to remind them why this judgment was coming. And again, think about how, how we've been taught to look at this verse, you know, perhaps in churches we've been in, verse 28. Wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will be gathered. Or another way of perhaps in, uh, translating this is wherever the body is, there the vultures will be gathered. But actually, the word that's used here for corpse, there's a reason why it's corpse and not body. It's because the word is referring to decaying flesh. Okay, where there is decaying flesh, the vultures are going to gather. I mean, that's what vultures do. They're, you know, they, they are scavengers and they're looking for dead carcasses to feed on. So this was a proverb that was used, a saying in those days that could be applied in a variety of ways. Now, Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown, who wrote a commentary on the entire Bible, say this, as birds of prey sent out the carrion, you know, the dead body, the dead carcass. So wherever is found a mass of incurable moral and spiritual corruption, there will be seen alighting the ministers of divine judgment. Okay, that's one possible interpretation, which is Jesus was saying, where the corruption of the Jews is found, there the Roman armies as ministers of divine judge, judgment and justice are going to gather to wipe it out. Now, another possible interpretation is this. It's interesting that the word vulture in the Greek is also translated eagle. And we noted earlier that when Titus dismantled the temple, that he set his, his ensign, which again, the standards of the Romans, you remember what the, was on the standard of the Romans? There was an eagle, okay? That was their, that was their sign, that was their image, okay? Well, Wherever the corruption is, there the eagles will gather. It could be that Jesus was saying, again, that the Romans were going to come and they were going to deal with the corruption of the Jews uh, in God's divine judgment. So, again, God's judgment on the Jews was terrible on account of the guilt of all the righteous blood shed on earth being charged against them. Remember what Jesus said, and we have to bear this in mind, that when God brings judgment, he doesn't, he doesn't bring judgment based simply upon the act itself, but upon the act as it's perhaps exacerbated, made worse, by what they knew before they actually committed the crime. Remember what Jesus said about Sodom and Gomorrah? it'll be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for Capernaum. And yet, read in the Bible what happened in Sodom and Gomorrah and read what happened in Capernaum. What happened in Sodom and Gomorrah? Sodomy? Evil. Just rape? You know, just evil, okay? And what happened in Capernaum? Well, Jesus preached. He did miracles in their streets, and they didn't receive him. Jesus said, it's going to be worse for Capernaum than for Sodom and Gomorrah. And that's because Capernaum had much more light. Much more light makes us much more responsible where there are great privileges, greater privileges. And the Jews had the greatest of all privileges, right? They not only had the, the, the covenant made with Abraham, but they had all the types and shadows, the promises, the mosaic economy, everything pointing to him. And God even sent Jesus to them, um, and they, they saw him, and they, they heard him. 
and they saw his miracles, but because of the great privileges they had and because they rejected him, their judgment would be greater. We need to be thankful, too, that God's compassion towards his own is equally great in delivering his own from this judgment. Now, let's not forget, um, we, we've had lots of, of privileges ourselves, haven't we? If we had rejected all that we know about Christ, same thing would, would fall on us, right? We would, rejecting greater light would, would cause greater judgment in the end. We need to be thankful that God has delivered us from that judgment through the Lord Jesus Christ. So in light of this, let's just remember, if not by the grace of God, you know, not for His grace, there we go. You know, we would be doing the same thing. And so out of thankfulness for the mercy that He has shown to us, the Lord tells us, show mercy to others. All right, well, that's all we're going to look at for this evening. Next week, we're going to look at what happens following the destruction of Jerusalem. Well, let's, let's bow in a moment of prayer. Let's, let's ask the Lord to, um, again, help us to apply what we've heard. If in no other way, just God is faithful to His Word. God is just. God is merciful. 